It's great to have you join us this afternoon for this webinar. I'm Brooks Holtam, uh, Director of the Change Management Advanced Practitioner Program at Georgetown University. I'm joined today by Dr. Ed Cook, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about his background to frame the conversation. But first, let me say thank you. We're so honored to have you with us today. It is a joy uh, to take a couple of hours this afternoon to develop ourselves professionally. And that's really the aim or goal of our time together. Let me tell you about Ed. Well, let me first uh, let you know that we'll be recording the session. Your faces and images won't be recorded, but we want to have it for our um, benefit. So Ed Cook has a unique background that comes together in great harmony in his current role as president of the Change Decision, a change management consulting firm. He has an undergraduate degree in aeronautical engineering, an MBA and a PhD in systems modeling and analysis. He's a visiting professor teaching information and analytics at the University of Richmond for MBAs, and as well teaches data and information for undergraduates. Now, lest you think he's a boring academic like me, he was also a pilot in the US Navy. He has over 2,500 flight hours and over 700 aircraft carrier landings. For this and other contributions, he was awarded the Bronze Star. He has extensive experience in corporate transformation, including bank and telecom acquisitions and the difficult post-merger integration work. He's led large teams to implement uh, major changes through creative data-driven change management approaches. I first met Ed when he made a compelling presentation to the DC chapter of the ACMP, Association for Change Management Professionals. He then very effectively taught a class session in my MS in business analytics course using data to drive change. After those two experiences, I wanted to bring his insights to you. And I'm confident that today you'll walk away from the webinar with new ideas about how to use data more effectively in leading change. My friends, welcome Ed Cook. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. And thanks for the chance to be here with all you guys. I'm, I'm glad we're gonna get to talk about this. I love this intersection between how do we handle teams and groups of people? How do we apply data to all of that? And then use some analytic techniques to try and make some headway. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about uh, two things. Uh, so we'll first kind of zoom in on the notion of finding influencers. And we're gonna talk about social network analysis with that. Um, and I'll, I'll do a little bit of concept, but mostly practical. Uh, so that's something that I'm hoping you can actually use, that's the, the goal. And then we'll take a, a break. And in the second half, we'll talk about metrics more broadly with regard to change. And, and I'll give you a bit of a framework uh, way to think about it. And then we'll uh, walk our way through how to actually go implement that. So again, I'm hoping that if you wanted to tomorrow, you could do something different for a change initiative or, or really any kind of a project uh, that you might be undertaking. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and fire up the PowerPoint and we'll walk through some ideas. All right, so I, I titled this Influencer Intelligence because what I'm trying to look at is out of the broad group of all the stakeholders that are possibly out there. And in some cases, as you guys have I'm sure have experienced, that could be hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people who would be stakeholders in some sort of a change initiative. But there's some subset of them that are gonna be influencers, true influencers. And if you could understand who they are and be able to have an impact on them, really kind of enlist them in helping you with the change initiative, then your chances of success are gonna be significantly increased. And so the way we wanna do that is to use uh, social network analysis and this idea of social network analysis. So probably useful to start off with, well, what is that? What is social network analysis? And there are lots of different uh, definitions that are out there, but I really like this one. Um, social network analysis is a process 
of investigating social structures through, through the use of networks and graph theory. And the graph theory thing, that's the math part of it. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about the basic concepts of that. And there's lots of depth to go into around the mathematics, but we don't need that. We don't, we don't need to do that in order to be able to understand what's going on. Cause you guys intuitively understand a lot of this already. Cause we're gonna look at social network analysis and how it characterizes the overall structure. So how are people connected by thinking in terms of nodes. So in our case, stakeholders, and in particular, we want to try and find the influencers inside them and the ties between them. So that's going to be their relationship or how they interact with each other. And we're going to use these ideas to try and help us to understand what is going on with this entire network and then who are the influencers in, in particular. Um, and so in addition to talking about these concepts, I'm also going to share with you a free Excel add-on that you can use to go actually do this analysis. And I'll show you, I'll do a little bit of a demo of that and show you how to do it. Um, but maybe first we can talk a little bit about why. Why would we even study social network analysis at all? And of all the time to talk about it, in the last 12 months, this has got to be the time to talk about social network analysis or network analysis just in general. I mean, we'll never be, use again this phrase viral in the same way in our lifetime, I'm sure. We'll always have this touch point of the last 15 months and unfortunately more to go to think about what that really means. So we've had this kind of practical physical example of what goes on in a social network and how in this case a virus, a horrible virus is transmitted around the entire globe. But in the US we've also had examples certainly last summer with Black Lives Matter around how information can be passed through a social network analysis and motivate people to movement, to go do something. Uh, and we saw a significant example of that throughout weeks over the summer, all of which we can understand, at least the transmission of the information, understand through social network analysis. And so this is a marvelous time to go and think about understanding social network analysis. So in this first section, I wanna talk about these three things. I wanna start with some concepts around really what's behind social networks. What does that even mean? And then we'll go in and do actually do some analysis. So how do we use these ideas to actually go do something? And I'll show you an example in Excel with a free add-on that you can get. Uh, and then have, coming out of that, what are we gonna do with it? And I'm going to use this term, a stakeholder management plan, but really it's just a plan. Like, our, given all this information, what are we now going to go do? That's actually going to have an impact on what is happening with this group of people that we're trying to influence. So let's talk about uh, some of these concepts. We'll, I'll talk a little bit about what social network analysis is, and then also uh, how we're going to apply these fundamental ideas. And I didn't mention this in the beginning, but I would ask you to uh, please go ahead and put something in uh, the Q&A as we go along. And I've asked Brooks to go ahead and interrupt me or help me jump into the questions because to the extent we can, we can make this a bit of a dialogue as you guys ask questions about what's going on. And I have way more content that we're gonna be able to cover in the next couple of hours. So I'm happy to deviate and kind of go where you guys are interested so that this lands and is useful for you. So, you know, please do that. All right, so um, why do we want to study social networks as a part of change management? Well, I think about these three things. So one first around social perception. So people tend to congregate together with those that are they are similar to. And that's no big giant insight. You guys are, are experiencing that all the time. And so because of that, that's where these social networks are made. And that network now that you're that tighter network and people that are similar to you can have a pretty profound impact on how you perceive reality how anyone perceives reality because you're taking in information from those people that are tightly tied in your network and because we tend to connect to those who are similar and push more away from those that are other we're going to get a bit of a reinforcing effect we've been talking about that for years now with regard to social media um, but there's also this idea of social influence in terms of how 
information actually flows. And so in the context of trying to manage change, information is gonna flow better on channels that we are connected to people that are similar to us. But those messages are gonna to tend to be reinforcing messages, right? So we're, we're not gonna hear things as well that come in from other parts of the network. And we're gonna rely on people that we're tied to maybe in particular people that we think of as influencers, even if we don't use that word, we have a notion of people that we tend to listen to more than others and have an impact about what we do and how we think about things. And then thirdly, this idea of social capital, and you guys I'm sure have all experienced this to some extent, which is people will jump into things when they're going to be successful and move away from things that are gonna be more likely to be failures. And so, this idea of the network reinforcing what is going to be a success and what's going to be considered a failure is going to be part of how people are going to react and that's going to be influenced by the network. So all three of those things come into play when we start to think about the change management initiative. All right, so that's the why. Let's talk about what this thing really is. Um, so on the left, I have an example, super simple example of a network. Um, and I'm setting it up so that we've got three different possibilities of how the people in this network are connected together. So you can have a strong tie, uh, which is shown by the thick lines that are there, a weak tie, which is the dotted lines that are there, and no tie, which means there, there isn't a connection. You don't have any kind of a connection with the, the people that are there. And there's gonna be impacts as a result of that. Um, you're gonna get reinforced messages from those strong ties. It's gonna be uh, very difficult to have things come through or more difficult to have them come through in the weak ties. And if there's no connection, then you're not getting a direct impact, right? So if I think about somebody that's on the far right of the diagram, their influence on someone on the far left of the diagram is gonna be diminished. It's gonna have to go through these other people that are there. That's obvious, right? You don't need a, an analysis to know that. You know that already. But setting this up so that we can then take a much bigger group and analyze it at the different levels, well, that, that is gonna be useful for us. So in order to do that, we wanna move from the graphical that we have on the, on the left. And that is very useful, right? You knew, you knew a lot about this network in just an instant from looking at it. You don't need a full on analytical view of it. If I had done this the other way around, if I had given you this grid first, and then say, okay, understand what's going on in the grid. Well, that's hard, right? The, the visualized part of it is much easier to understand. But we can convert the graphical view into the analytic view. And so all I'm doing is taking all the people, and I've now labeled them A through J. And so you can see that on the left-hand side. And then each person is now on both the horizontal and vertical. And I, those are, we can refer to those as a vertex, but, and that's what's it, that's the name of graph here. This is a human, the person in our set. And edges, what's going on in between them is the connection that they have. And so I, I made the strong ties 10, and I made the weak ties three, and I made no ties zero. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to actually apply those numbers and how would you even figure out what the values are, because that is going to be important. And the way in which we would read this, if we're trying to understand the connection from between E and D, I would start at E and go over and we would come down from D and then we see that there's a value of 10 there. So it's a strong tie. And you can see that as well in the very center of the diagram where there's the label that says strong tie and you see that thick line that's in between them. In this particular setup, I'm assuming that the connections are the same between them, meaning that person D thinks of himself as having a strong tie to person E, and person E thinks of herself as having the same level of a strong tie to person D. That is not necessarily true in the real world, but just to keep this simpler, I'm going to go with this kind of symmetric set where the two people view each other the same. Um, I'll show you the example when we get to it in the tool where that's not true and you get a much more complex behavior. So we've got this together. Now we can actually do some analysis on this and try to understand really what's going on here within this entire network. So I've got my same setup. I've got the same graph or graphical setup and now the same analytic setup. 
all I've done now is I've grayed out the zeros just so that the threes and the tens pop out more. And I've done two things. I've added up how many connections going down on, on these columns. And I've also added up the strength of those connections. And you can see it's starting to tell me a little bit about what's going on in the network analytically. Again, stuff you probably picked up on pretty quickly as you were looking at it on the diagram. And so we can see that person G has got the most connections, four. Um, and then most of the others are two and there's a few threes in there. We can also see, not too surprisingly, that person G has the greatest strength of connections at 33. Person G's got the most high, so not too surprising they have the most connections, although that's not necessarily always true. And then we can see that there is actually some pretty big differences in behavior across all the people that have just two ties, right? It's as low as six, and you can see it goes as high as 20 across those. And so that's a pretty big difference in terms of the strength of connection across. So it's those ties are not the same. And there, there's probably something for us to understand in terms of who the influencers are going to be. So even just based off of this, you have to look at person G and go, well, that person has got more connection possibilities in here. And so in a way, has a certain level of higher influence than some of the other people in the network. Um, but that's not the only way for us to be able to go look at it. And we'll explore some more of those in the future. But before we get there, I wanna talk just a bit about this asymmetrical part that I mentioned before. And we have this notion of in degree and out degree. So in degree, not surprisingly, is the number of ties directed to the node and out degrees the number of the ties coming out of the node. If you wanted to think about it in terms of your Twitter account, in degree would be the number of people that are following your Twitter account. Out degree would be the number of other people that you are following. If we were thinking about this in a change context, in degree might be a measure of influence, maybe popularity, whereas out degree might be a measure of extroversion or social ability. Um, and so we can use those ideas to help us to understand what is going on with this particular network. So with we have asymmetric connections, the differences in in-degree and out-degree might really matter. And we'll see that in our example when we get there. But that's not the only thing that we're going to want to pay attention to, right? There's this, uh, also this idea around the um, connections themselves and what they mean. So one of the ideas that we could have in here is this notion of closest centrality. And that's just the idea of the total distance from one node to all of the other nodes. And so we're gonna basically measure the average shortest path from a node to all the other nodes. The lower that distance means the closer the node is to all of the other nodes. So if we wanna take an example, let's look at person F, we'll call her Frida. And we wanna see what is the value that we've got for her against all of the other nodes. So add them all up and then calculate the average. That's gonna be the closeness centrality for freedom. So how does that matter? Well, it, it shows up in this like broader idea, which you may have heard this notion of six degrees of separation. Um, back in the nineties, there was this idea of six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon. I don't know why that started, but that became a big thing. Um, and that all goes really back to the 50s. And it was an experiment done uh, by Stanley Milgram where they literally back then sent out letters, asked people to forward the letters, and then they measured how many hops it took for those, some of those letters to get back to the original starting point. And on average, it was six. So this notion of everyone in the United States is Sit only six degrees of separation away from every other person. That's where that came from. Since then, and with the advent of email, now social network game, those experiments have been done um, through those means as well. And the average now is much closer to three. So in a very real sense, as a country, we become more tightly networked together because now each person on average is only three hops away from every other person, which is sort of amazing when you think about it, that you are only three steps away from the other 300 plus million people that are in the US. So very much more easy to be able to make those connections. And you can 
see that graphically on LinkedIn. It tells you actually what your connection level is from all of these other people. Uh, and um, you can get a notion of really how far away you are. And so somebody that's got a more tightly connected network, individual network, is like more likely to be an influencer in the uh, case of our change. And so again, somebody that you might want to pay attention to. Uh, and then the last one I wanted to take a look at here is this idea of betweenness centrality. Uh, and this is really looking at who is in between here. So if you want to think about it as the people that are the bridges between groups, and in, in this case, in our diagram, you can see that we really have two clumps, one on the left and one on the right, and persons D, E, and F are acting as the bridge. Now, this is kind of a weird network. It probably doesn't show up that often in the real world, but it, you know, it's useful for our discussion here. But if any of those three people, D, E, or F, were to leave the network, the network would split into two, right? It doesn't have a way to connect except through those three people. So if you're thinking about that, that as an influencer, um, characteristic, they actually make the connection between different groups. Well, those people have a higher level of influence. It's not possible to send a message from one side to the other through the social network unless it goes through persons F, E, and D. And so um, it's going to be important for us to pay attention to them. But one of the things we can also learn from this and by putting this together analytically is if we add in two connections, so if I just put these two connections in orange in here, we change the network tremendously, right? So it is a much more tightly tied network just because of those two connections. We can look at that analytically as well, but you can see it yourself, right? So now if I'm person G and person F comes out or person D comes out of the network, well, I still have a way to connect to the other side. Now, both of them come out, well, now I disconnect again. But now it takes at least, because of those two ads, there's gonna to have to be something more significant happening for the two parts of the network to actually split and become two separate networks. That can be useful to know when we're thinking about a change initiative in that you might wanna explicitly come up with tactics to make connections between different parts of the network literally change how the network comes together so that you are able to have a bigger influence on what is going on with uh, that network and be able to communicate more quickly. So I mean, it may be something as simple as explicitly bringing these people together for an interaction so that now that they know each other, you may ask a couple of people to actually do some particular function as part of whatever the change initiative is, be explicit about it and intentional because now you know, you can see that in the network that there would be value in it, as opposed to just pulling a bunch of people together and hoping that something good is gonna happen from by increasing the network. That is certainly true to some extent, but it doesn't have the same level of intentionality that you might be able to get if you're really targeting it and using this as a way for you to get smarter about how to do something good with the network to be able to help the change initiative along. So if we go and look at these four measures, in degree, out degree, closest centrality, and between this centrality, we can zero in pretty effectively on what is going on with the network and then understand the influencers in that network. Um, and that can be incredibly valuable for how we go about executing on the chain, certainly valuable for how we go about pushing out information or communicating about what is going to be happening within that chain. And so we're going to want to calculate these. Fortunately, the tool I'm going to show you will actually do all that work for you. So we don't need to go through and do all the math to make it happen. We're not going to have to do a bunch of different calculations. It'll just make those happen. What's useful for you is to know this, these basic definitions that I've given you about what these things mean so that you are able to interpret the information that's gonna be coming out of uh, the tool. All right, so let's talk a little bit about actually like doing some of this uh, social network analysis and how we're actually gonna go make that part happen, cover the concepts that we need to. Now we wanna get into like how we're actually gonna do this. So the tool I wanna show you is called 
Node Excel. And it, it's actually technically an Excel template. But if you go and download Node Excel, and the hyperlink is there in the bottom left. So this is coming from the Social Media Research Foundation. Um, and they offer this for free. You can see they've got some different level. I've never used the pro or the cloud version. I've only used the free version. Use that in both the consulting work that I do as well as part of the uh, analytics classes that I teach at the University of Richmond. I'm, I'll just make this disclaimer. I'm not connected to the Social Media Research Foundation. You can go buy it or not buy it. That's great. I'm just giving this to you because there's one out there that's free that you can go use. Um, it is only available on um, PC, so they don't have a Mac version. I'm actually starting to play with uh, another tool that's out there. I'll, I'll give you the name. It's uh, Gephi, G-E-P-H-I, uh, that is workable on both PCs and Macs. I tried it out on the PC, it works great. I'm gonna try it out on a Mac to see how that works. Again, they've got a free version as well, and it sits on top of Excel, which makes it super useful. But this is what we're going to use. We're going to, uh, for this demonstration, uh, use Node Excel. And to make it more interesting, I'm going to give you uh, an example. So this is a semi-fictitious company. I'll tell you why it's semi-fictitious in a second. Um, so our semi-fictitious company is called Leadership Skyward. And Leadership Skyward is an aviation leadership experience company. And what they do is they take executives on two and three day excursions where they focus in on communication and decision-making as it's done by pilots in the cockpit. And they're using that to build the executive's skills in those areas uh, and to be able to see things from a different point of view. Their hook is that they actually take the executives flying so that they have to practice those skills in the aircraft. So this is uh, semi-fictitious because this is on my list of things to go do someday. I would love to go start this company and make it happen. But right now, it's just an interesting fictitious example for us, but maybe someday you'll, you'll be able to see that out in the world when I'm actually doing it. Um, what's going on for our change is that the CEO of Leadership Skyward has decided to step down. He's founded the company and um, has been one of the main flyers in the company, one of the pilots that actually creates these experiences for the executives. But he wants to step away from the CEO role. He is, however, going to uh, remain the owner and continue to be an active pilot with the organization. But this is a pretty significant change because we're talking about the CEO founder stepping out of the role and somebody else coming in. So you've ever experienced anything like that, even if it has been done well, you know that that is a significant change. And there are a lot of people that may be um, impacted either positively or negatively, depending on how well that change goes. So uh, one of the elements that we wanna take on is to understand who are the influencers within the company, within Leadership Skyward, and try and identify all of them so that we can use that identification to be able to set ourselves up better to be able to take on the change itself. And so we're gonna to wanna to go analyze that. All right, so I'm gonna hop out of PowerPoint and I'm gonna bring up Excel and uh, this example that I've already pulled together. And I wanna go back and use the concepts that we've talked about uh, to be able to pull the data and the information out of this tool and then be able to go and find out who are the influencers within this group that we would then feed into our plan around managing this change. All right, so here we go. Come out of Excel, I'll stop sharing the PowerPoint and we're gonna go jump into and take a look at the um, Excel. All right, so right now we are in um, Excel and I've already gone through and done the data load on this. I'm not gonna explain to you after we talk about what's in here, how we actually get the data in, um, cause that's gonna be pretty significant. Um, it takes a little bit of planning and thought ahead of time in order to be able to go do that. 
But for right now, um, we have the data loaded in here. And let me just describe what we're looking at. So we have a regular Excel sheet here right now. And on the left-hand side, you see all the names of the people. So in the language of social network theory, that's those are vertices. So you see that in the um, tab name down here, but they're humans, right? These are the different people that are, are in the company. And so that's what's uh, uh, denoted there. And then on the edges, this is the connections that there are between the people. So if we, we go and we click on that, we can now see the pairs of people and which ones are connected to which. And over here on the right-hand side, we're getting a depiction over here of what these folks all look like. So, and how they are connected to each other over here. And so each of the points, in, in this case, we have it in a circle. I'm gonna show you some other possibilities in a second. And we can see where the connections are. And you can see even in this diagram, there are some people that are more connected to other people. And you can see various areas in here in this depiction where the network is more tightly connected than in other places. Uh, and that's going to be important. We're going to want to understand that. That's exactly the point of this exercise is to go through all of that and be able to know who the influencers are. Um, what's happening in Excel, just so you can kind of understand that, is we've got uh, a new um, add-on here. And you can see this Node Excel Basic that I've got up here at the top. And that is giving us uh, the um, extra functionality. And all it is, I, I told you it was a, a a template. So you're basically downloading a template from the site that the Social Media Research Foundation has. As you bring it up, it's going to add this functionality in to the template. So you're not actually altering Excel. It's living inside of the template. Um, so you don't, you, you're even more protected within the system that you've got. So you can feel comfortable about using all of that. All right. So I'm going to go back now over to the vertice tab because um, uh, I want to connect back to the analytical pieces that we talked about. Um, and that information is over here slightly to the right. All right. And you can see right here that we've got some of these things that we were talking about. So we see that first the in degree that we've got. I um, mean, again, that's how many connections are coming in. And so we might grab this and just sort it from largest to smallest. And then we can see the top like five or so people those are the folks that have the most connections coming in. You can also see that as I click on one of them, in this case, we'll click on Becky. Over here on the right, Becky lights up and all the connections that Becky has lights up. So you can see now in red, these various connections uh, that she has. You can see them physically now on the diagram uh, as you try and understand what's going on uh, within this particular connection and the setup of this network. We can also then take a look at the out degree right now. This, these are the connections that are going out. And again, we can do potentially go through and do the same exercise. So we can grab the out degree. We can sort it from largest to smallest. And we can now see who are the people that have the connection. Not surprisingly, they tend to line up with those with the in degree. They, they won't completely. And you may find some striking differences with some of the groups that you might have, where you have a lot of people, or not a lot of people, sorry, a person or maybe a handful of people that have a lot of connections going into them. So the leader of an organization may be somebody that's like that. You take this group and let's imagine that there's 180 of them. Well, they probably all feel they have some connection into the CEO. But the CEO is probably not equally as connected into everybody else in the company. That's just the nature of, of large groups. And so we can see some differences between the in degree and the out degree. Uh, as you move on, you can also take a look at the betweenness and closeness centrality, right? So we're going to be able to see more about what's going on here. And in this case, we can already see that there's a couple of other things going on. There are high values for people that are further down the list. So if I take that and sort this one from largest to smallest, now I'm going to be able to see the people that are acting as bridges. And there are some folks in here who are more of a, a bridge influence than some of the others. Um, in particular, you can see, although this person here has a 
lower uh, in degree and out degree, they have a relatively high uh, impact on their betweenness centrality. You can see them lit up in the diagram to the right. So Penelope, who's over here, is clearly in between at least two groups within this network. And when I rearrange it, you'll get a chance to see it in uh, a little, little bit more clearly. So she's got an important point in here, and she does not show up in the in degree and the out degree, but she does show up when we look at the between the centrality. And so this could matter significantly to how we think about what's going on in the network, because if we don't have Penelope well engaged with us, as part of the change and able to help us in the transmitting of the messages that we want, whatever those are, in this case about what's going on with the CEO change, we could be in trouble because we may be missing part of this entire organization because she can be a bit of a gatekeeper as to what is going on with the information. On the other hand, she can be a significant transmitter for us and allow us to be able to get to this other part of the network in a way that we couldn't have gotten to as easily before. Uh, we can do the same thing as we take a look at the closeness centrality. Remember, this is at six degrees of separation idea playing coming into play here. And we go and we reorient all of these to get a chance to see who the top players are there. And in this case, we're getting a lot of the same folks, but we do tend to pop some others. So Victor starts to show up here higher in this um, uh, ranking than he was showing up before. So Victor may matter in here as well. And we wouldn't have seen either Penelope or Victor if we were just looking at numbers of connections. We we're just counting up those connections. This is a slightly more sophisticated way for us to be able to step in and see really what is going on with um, this particular setup of people. And it allows us to be able to do um, a more thoughtful analysis of what we're going to want to pay attention to as we start to dig in and really understand what's happening. So we can see that there are some significant folks in here that are going to be influencers. Some of them just because they have the numbers of connection. One of them that uh, wasn't showing up before because of acting as a bridge and another because of just the closeness that that particular person has uh, across this entire network. And so we want to target some messaging going on to Penelope and Victor because of what they're doing, but also to these top folks, Frida, Ed, Becky, and Cassandra, because of the number of connections that those people have. So we can see that analytically here. We can also get a pretty good view visually. So I'm going to open up uh, the diagram so you can see that part of the diagram um, better. And I'm going to show you some of the other ways in which we're able to create visualizations of this. So there's some data visualization that's happening in here too. There are two algorithms at the top. So we're gonna take a look first at the Crookman Rheingold algorithm. So I'll, I'll select that and then have Node Excel refresh the graph. And what this one attempts to do is it attempts to rearrange what is going on and place all of these different uh, nodes in a way that breaks them out and starts to show the groupings that are there. Now, it's not perfect as you can see, and there are some pieces that don't work so, so well, but there's a few that pop out pretty quickly. Like we can see these nodes out here that are solos, right? They only have one other person that they're able to connect into. And so we're not gonna be able to get to those people unless we're um, making that connection. So if I click on that node, again, these light up and I can see who that is, that's Hector in this case. and so. There's a couple of people that Hector is the only one that they're connected to in this entire network. And so that can be significant for us. We can also see quickly some of these more dense nodes that are gonna be in here as we take a look at what's going on in them. And so you can see Cassandra right here in the middle of the network. And as that lights up, we can see where Cassandra is playing across all these different areas. So this is interesting um, to be able to just do a quick bounce around and kind of see what is going on with what is happening within uh, this network just by taking a look at that. All right, so Louise asked a question. Uh, I would love to show this to my boss, but getting firsthand experience in using this before doing to, how can I best do that? So Louise, if you just go to the um, Social Media Research Foundation, at the very top in the tab, there's they have a free download. 
and you can just download this template. Uh, what you need to do is just open up the template and all the functionality will come there. You don't need to load it or install it or any of that kind of stuff. It's really easy to use uh, right on top of Excel. The one thing that you can't do, and I'll talk about that in just a second, is let me, I'll describe to you how do you actually get the data in there. Um, so I'll, I'll do that as soon as we um, finish up this little section here. All right, so the last one in here is I'll just take, I want to show you one other depiction. So uh, this uh, Harold Corrin one, which is this fast, called a fast multi-scale one. Uh, the idea is that the algorithm to pull it together is easier to run. In this case, it doesn't really matter because this is a relatively small network. But you can use this tool um, on your own uh, social network um, properties that you have, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, any of the things where they will let you download the information. You can take that and load it into here and analyze your own network if you want to. But and the reason you use this one is that it'll calculate quickly. You don't need a big giant computer to go do that. We don't need to worry about that here because we're nowhere close to something that's going to slow us down. But one of the things I do like about it is it tends to bring the network together in clumps. And so you can see I have this clump of people. There's one part of the network that's pretty tightly tied in the bottom right down here. And then uh, another, uh, I'll call it tranche that is more loosely tied and tend to only really come through these two people. Now you can see there are other connections, but primarily they're making their connection back through these two people. And then you got a few people out here that are more pushed out to the fringes of the network. And so this one's a good way to be able to see all of that and actually understand what's going on. And so between a little bit of the analytics that it has and a little bit of the graphics that it has in Node Excel, and especially like the case where you're able to come in and understand what's happening with these, these different groupings in here. And then also just come over here, click on somebody and have it light up what's going on in the network can be really useful. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview of uh, what you're able to do uh, inside all of this. Let me collapse some of this down, make the diagram just a, a bit smaller and um, we can go and take a look at uh, what's going on in this last uh, piece here, which is the uh, overall metrics. Um, so you get a little bit of analytics in here, of some overall metrics, just kind of give you a quick overview of what's happening here. So it's counting up how many people, you know, I told you this was a group, uh, a company of 180, I just loaded 24 fictitious people in here just to give us something about what's going on. But we still have uh, 68, 168 edges on here. So a decent number of connections. Um, but we can get an even better view of really what that means as we start to get further into some of these. So we can see uh, how many people have uh, reciprocation going back and forth um, and look at the percentages of those. So I feel I'm connected to you. Do you feel you're connected to me? It's not everyone. They don't all feel that way. And we can see that in here. Um, the average distance is less than two. So it's a pretty tight network, right? We're way underneath the three that I talked about that's happened in these other tests. And that's somewhat to be expected. I mean, this is a company, not the entire country. But the density is somewhat low, right? It's only 30% density. You would think in a company with people that are working with each other a lot that you might have more density with all of that. But that's not what we're seeing here. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that's interesting to note and gives you some information about what's really happening with this network. All right, so let me stop that and I want to go back and talk about now how do we get the data uh, into this network uh, in the first place. So let's come back and um, come in here. I should note for um, all of you that the, all the aircraft uh, that you see on here, this is my wish list of airplanes I want to buy. So if I ever win the lottery or if any of you are multimillionaires and are feeling generous, you, you, you can buy off any of these on the list. I, I'd love to start with this one in the bottom here, this little two-person seaplane. That would be awesome. If you want free analytics, buy a seaplane, I'll do whatever you need. So you can just put that in the back of your mind. All right, so let's talk about like, how's this whole thing fitting together and then what are we gonna do with it? So we wanna be able to do this in a way that we're actually able to chase after a plan, right? We wanna eventually get to a plan about what's going on here. So. First step is, can we actually identify the stakeholders? I'm going to show you how to do that in just a second. So this is how do we get the data in the first place. 
to be able to put it in there and load. Next, we'll go, go through, we want to measure what the connections are, actually determine what that strength is. Then we're going to load that data into a tool. I just showed you Node Excel, uh, but we can use other tools as well to go through and analyze the data, identify who are the influencers or the ones who are likely to be influencers because of the way they are positioned in the network. And then we'll go then be able to go and create our stakeholder plan. Um, if you've done change work or change management work before, been engaged in that, you're used to step one and step four. Two and three, that's more specific now. That's where we're bringing in this social network analysis. Uh, by pulling that in, we can be much more precise about who are these influencers. Um, and we're doing that analytically. You could potentially do that through surveys and find that information out. And I would actually encourage you to do that because it's just another layer on top. We'll actually talk a little bit more about that in the second section, this kind of a layered metrics approach. Um, but I really like having this kind of direct ability to pull it all in. All right, so let's talk about step two. How do we actually get the information to be able to do this? So what I'm going to describe to you is an approach um, that I'm using in two places. So done this within the change work that we've done. So this is a, a collection method to use in an actual change initiative. Uh, but I actually uh, use it every year in my uh, classes as well. And I do at the beginning of the year and I do it at the end of the year so that I can see to what extent the network has actually been increased, the density of the network has been increased. And to what extent does that impact the grades and students have? And right now, I can say loosely with some pretty decent confidence that it, the people that get more connected tend to have better grades. And I think that's because they have more people to go to to be able to get help as they're going through the work or other people are coming to them. And so they're giving more help. And so there's that interaction there. So in the classroom setting, those are the influencers. And it's good to understand them and actually make sure I put those people into groups with others that are less connected so that I can increase the connection density within the classroom network. Same idea within the change. And the way to go about doing that is to give people a matrix, similar, just as an easy matrix, it's like this, similar to the, what I was showing you earlier in the PowerPoint, with all the names going down one side and then across the top. And then I ask people to find their name and then go across the row and then put in a value for how they are connected to everybody else that's within this network. The trick here is to give them a scale, a rubric, to be able to make that determination. And this is where you're gonna to have to be very thoughtful because you wanna know what it is that you want to measure. T typically within a change context, you're probably gonna to wanna to measure influence, but it may be information passing. And you're gonna to wanna to narrow in on the question that you actually ask them so it, it's clear for them what it is that they're supposed to be doing. So for the students, I'll give you that example which you see here on the left-hand side. If, it, if you don't know the person at all, that's a zero. Yeah, if you know that person, but you have very little interaction with them, that's a one. A five is that somebody that you see, um, you're seeing each other a couple times a week and maybe you have one conversation a week. 10 would be, you see that person every day and you have a conversation with them every day. Because I'm trying to get a notion of how connected they are to everybody else. And they have no problem doing this, right? They, are able to easily get through. It literally takes a couple minutes. I just ask them to do it in, in the class. Um, I use an Excel spreadsheet so that they're all doing it individually. Nobody sees what anybody else is giving because that would bias the information. And so I don't want them to see what everybody else is saying. And you probably won't want to do that in a change initiative either because you, you don't want people to be looking at what others are saying and then alter their values as a result of that. In a change context, you may ask a question like this. Um, if you are trying to get help to be able to do a task, who is the person that you're going to go to? 10 would be, no matter what the task is, no matter who, it, no matter what's going on, I'm always going to try and go to this person in one of the first people that I go to. Five may be, I would go to this person just as readily as I might go to anybody else. One would be, I probably wouldn't go to this person, but if no one else was around and I knew that they knew it, then I would go to them 
to get information. Zero, I'm never gonna go to that person. Maybe I don't know who they are. And then ask them to fill it out that way. That is narrowing in very specifically now on where are these people gonna go to get help? Because that might be the kind of thing that you wanna get out of this particular change. Maybe you're implementing a new system in a call center and you want the call center agents you want to know of the call center agents who are the particular experts that everybody is going to go to to ask for information and that can be very valuable to know maybe you want to pull them in to some sort of an ambassador team and be able to have them engage more in what is going on with the change because they're the people that everyone else is going to go to and it could be useful to know that and uh, enlist them in a different way than you might be enlisting everybody else in the chain so that's just an example there are lots of different ways that you could go and do it. It, it. You may ask who are the people that you go to for any kind of help? Who are the people that you get the best information from? Who are the people that you get advice from? All kinds of different ways to ask that question. So you really wanna be thoughtful about what is the one that's gonna tell you what you need to know for this particular change. Um, that way you get that data. You collect all this information, it's in this matrix form and there's uh, an easy upload that you can do. Um, I don't think I mentioned this before, but I, I have put together a little uh, primer on how to use Node Excel. Um, I'll give you my uh, email contact information. I'm happy to just send it to you. If you decide that you want to use this, um, I'm happy to send that primer over to you. It's, uh, I give it to my students in class and I've been handing it out to other people too. It's just a little step-by-step, -step, how do you get the data? How do you upload it in the Node Excel? And then how do you go about um, analyzing it? And there's lots of other free things that you can use out there, certainly YouTube videos as well. So this is not the only place to get that info, but I'm happy to give it to you if that's going to be valuable for you guys. All right, so we've gone through, we've done uh, the analysis now of, of what we need to do. We've used uh, that and we've been able to analyze what's happening at Leadership Skyward. Now it's time to take that and put it in to the a stakeholder management plan. And I, I won't spend a lot of time on this because this is a much deeper topic to get into, but I, I just want to put all of this into uh, context. And um, the stakeholder management plan is the place to have that land. So the way that I would suggest that you kind of think about it is in these kind of four steps. So if I was going to put together an influencer engagement plan, I would think about these, these things. So one, decide you know, what influencers do I want to focus on. So this is going to be what question am I asking so I can find out who the influencers are. And that's going to be important as I go through because I may get different people depending on what the question is. And so we want to be very thoughtful about what that question is and how does it align to the change that you're going to do. Then move on to going through a stakeholder analysis uh, conversation. All right, now that we've got this, we want to decide who are these people that, um, and what are we going to ask them to go do for us? Um, that's step three, getting into the actions that we're going to ask of them. You may enlist them together as a group. You might go to them individually. You might spend more time communicating to them. It will be different depending on what the change is. So I, I can't really give you a blanket thing to do every time, but um, that's a smart way to go about understanding how to have an impact on the change. And then I would suggest that you're periodically going back and re reviewing that to see what's happening because there could be changes going on within the organization, changes within the, cha the change initiative itself. And so making sure that you're staying on top of what is going on with those influencers, uh, that's gonna be important. So you may wanna repeat this analysis if it's a initiative that's going on for a long time. So something that was going on for a year, I would certainly wanna do this analysis more than once because almost for sure, something is gonna be changing along the way. And so I'd pull all that together in this context uh, and be able to use that as a way to really hone in on how I'm thinking about my stakeholder management plan. All right, so one other thing I just wanted to offer you guys, and you can get this uh, for free, it's on the website, and you can see it at the, the URL at the bottom right. So I've been pulling together uh, information about using this kind of tool to get to how people are networked together and asking them questions about what has driven their best team experience. Um, so if you would like that, this is just a, 
compilation of the information we have, you can go out to the website and grab that and use some of this network approach to go get it. And it's been just this fascinating exercise to go through and hear what people say makes up the best team. This idea of the tightness of the network is important to that um, and shows up with how people are related to each other, how are they getting that information. Um, so if you find that valuable, please go uh, grab that. We've got it out there for, for anyone to have. All right, and so that kind of closes off this section of what is going on um, within understanding a network and then using that to be able to pick out who the influencers are. Um, so what I would suggest is go play with this. Go out to uh, the Social Media Research Foundation, grab a free copy of Node Excel and try it out. Um, if you want the primer, if you would, wouldn't mind sending me uh, an email around that, that would be great. I'd be happy to kick it back out to you. I can, uh, I'll put my, take a break here and I'll put my name in the chat so you'll have that or my email in the chat so you'll have that when we come back. But I'm happy to send that to you and I would just go try it out. And as you work with it a little bit, I think you will uh, readily become more comfortable with using it. And I think it can be a great way to get uh, an insight series of insights really into what is going on with the network that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna pause there and I uh, just wanna see are there any other questions and I'm happy to answer some of those. Uh, and then we can uh, jump in and uh, or jump to a break and go get a glass of water. So what do you guys got? Any thoughts or questions? All right, well, if you guys are good or you want to ponder those, we can certainly ask them as we come back. Oh, Louise has got her hand raised. All right, so Louise, I don't know if you could go ahead and type in your question and then uh, we can take a, take a look at what's going on with that. Oh, you, sorry. All right, great. Well, looks like we might be okay right now. Why don't we um, go ahead and take 10 minutes. You guys got some questions, you can put them in via the Q&A. That would be great. I could take a look at those and answer them when we come back. And then we'll jump into this broader discussion around uh, change analytics. So um, why don't we shoot for seven minutes? I got 358 on uh, my clock. Can we come back at five minutes after four? And we'll jump back in. All right. See you guys in seven minutes. Could be maybe you want to uh, work with 
that person to see if you can get them to be a positive influencer on the change. Um, often that will work, so not always, but often. And then the other is, are there other potential influencers who you can strengthen or at least increase numbers of connections to so that you are getting uh, the value that you want out of uh, this influencer analysis that you're doing and trying to understand really what is going on uh, with all the folks that are there. So I think it really gets down to what is it that you want to know? Uh, and then if you knew it, are you going to go do something about it? And that's actually a pretty important theme that I want to talk to you as we jump into uh, the rest of thinking about analytics for a change initiative and to some extent for, for any kind of a project. So I'm going to go uh, now move on to uh, the second one um, and think about meaningful metrics. And what um, I'd ask you guys, uh, please go ahead and pop your questions in along the way as we go and um, try to answer them as they pop up, as well as to try and I'll catch whatever we don't get to uh, at the end. So now I'm going to zoom out a bit, right? We went straight into this one area to start with and use social network theory to think about influencers in particular. So now I want to give you a broader context of metrics and how to think about that uh, for a change initiative more generally. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how I think this fits into here. So I want to talk about these three things. So the value of change analytics, um, how you could actually get insight from the metrics, insight into your change. And then I'll finish with a, so what? Like, what are you going to do about it? And for me, that's so what is always around making a decision. There, there's no point in gathering up all the data to do some analysis. If you're not going to decide something at the end, make it, take action as a result of that. And I'll give you a little framework to think about how to go about doing that. Uh, but first, I want to see if we can do a, a bit of a poll. And just kind of want to, if you guys would, share with me uh, what you think about uh, analytics and uh, what, what that really means to you. Um, so um, if you would uh, go ahead, you can should be able to go in here and you can either, as you can see, go straight to the website uh, or you can use your phone um, and I'll activate the poll and you guys should be able to go ahead and if you would just either text me or put into the website a phrase or a word or two of what comes to mind for you when you hear analytics. And this could be anything from uh, uh, something I totally want to avoid because I hate math or something I'm really interested in, whatever it is. I'm just kind of curious how you guys think about it. Um, and if you would, go ahead and pop those in and we'll see what kind of an interesting word cloud we can make out of that. Or if not, I'm going to make up some stuff and I'll uh, tell you what I think about it. And this is one of the things that I try and do with my classes because I get reaction from them, uh, I get a better understanding from them about how they're feeling about these things and where they are feeling confident and where they're where they're not really feeling all that confident. All right, so I'm gonna make my my poll's not working. I tested before. Lynn just gave me a text and said it wasn't working. All right, well, I'm gonna skip that because maybe we're not uh, getting the what we need from that. So sorry for that, folks. Um, but you can tell me later what you feel about analytics. So let's jump in and talk about uh, the value of change analytics. Uh, and really, I think what you're doing is you're trying to answer uh, this question. How do you know if you're getting anywhere? So using the analytics to be able to understand what is happening with the change uh, and knowing are you making the progress that you want and then also what to do about it. So are you gathering information so that as you learn about what's going on, you know what actions to take, what decisions to make at the end to be able to go have a, an influence on your change. And so this is the um, process, I think, to be able to go in and think about it. But the first thing we're going to need to pay attention to as we go through this is to think about some pretty common uh, skeptical answers out of there. And um, this shows up, I think, often. People will talk about this whole idea of 
getting metrics around the change as being too inexact. And my answer to that is, would be that exact is not necessary. If you can get directional information, that's good enough. You just need to know if you're on the right track or not. Are you improving or not? And then be able to take action from that. I've heard the skeptics say it's too subjective. Well, I would disagree. I would actually say you want the subjective stuff. I'm going to show you how to include the subjective stuff because that has value that you're going to miss if you stay completely objective in the way in which you pull it all together. People will say too qualitative. And again, qualitative does give you good direction, especially combined with any quantitative information that you have. You can peg where you are and peg whether or not you're making uh, the appropriate moves to get where you need to be. And then finally, uh, too difficult. And to be sure, I would agree that it is possible to overdo this, right? You can spend way too much time trying to pull all of these metrics together and that may not be valuable. So what I'm gonna suggest is scaling the effort that you have to the value that you're gonna get out of knowing what is going on with this particular change that you might be working with. So that is going to be important because we wanna make sure we're not overdoing it as we go in here. So uh, I wanna give you this kind of view about where we are in the entire map of mathematics. Some of you may be um, have a gut tightening feel right now once you start to talk about math. I promise not to go through all of this, but I love this diagram and uh, Dominic Walliman's got it out there for uh, free use for our in an academic environment. So uh, thanks to him for allowing us to be able to use this. What we can see here is pure math that's more in the purple stuff on the left and applied math, the blue stuff that's on the right. Um, so we're going to be in the applied math section and, and mostly in the upper right. And what I want to do is give you a little bit of a framework around different levels of analytics. So descriptive analytics, where we're literally describing what's going on. Predictive analytics, we're trying to say what's going to happen in the future. And prescriptive analytics, which is do this exact thing to get the best outcome. So descriptive is going to be probability, statistics, data visualization. Any of those things are describing what's going on uh, with the data. Whereas predictive is gonna be things like regression and simulation, behavioral economics uses these. And you see some of those tools in the upper right part of the blue diagram. Prescriptive is when we're saying, this is the exact thing that we need to go do in order to understand what's going on. So optimization is in here, decision analytics, game theory. Those all tell us, given this situation, these parameters and these limits, Here's exactly uh, what we need to do in order to have a good outcome. So we're going to start uh, more in the descriptive side. So use those kind of basic tools to be able to gain our understanding. And we're really trying to make this move from data to information and then on to knowledge, kind of uh, advancement across the spectrum. And the way in which I would suggest you do that is with this three layered metrics approach. So the first layer is uh, self-reported. And people that do change work use this a lot. It's a survey kind of a, an approach on um, what is going on, what are people saying about what's happening. Other ways to get there as well, we'll dive into some of those. We'll also wanna bring in observable behavior. So what do the manager see, or maybe you have an ambassador group, um, what are they seeing that is going on uh, with the group of people that are there? And then finally, existing metrics. So metrics that are already in the business, um, hopefully metrics that are part of a business case that's associated with the change. And there's some reason that you're taking on this change initiative, some business value that's supposed to come out of it. We want to know what that is and be able to show that the change initiative is having impact on that business value. That's why we're doing the change in the first place. So although the other metrics are all helping us to know if we're getting there or not, these are really the output metrics that tell us whether or not good things are happening to the organization, the ones that we want to have happen, which is why we're going down this initiative in the first place. So let's dive in a little bit and talk about some of these. So it, it may be at level one, the self-reported uh, question like this, this is pretty common. I feel ready for the change. And in Q1, you might look at that and people say, 60% say yes, they feel ready for the change. And you ask the question again in Q2, and only 30% feel ready for the change. 
Well, that might be on the surface kind of alarming, right? The numbers are going down. That may be true or may not be true. It's hard to tell with just this, which is why we want to have the other information in. It may be that when you ask the question in Q1, it was too early and people weren't really ready to pay attention to it. In Q2, they started paying attention and understanding what's really going on with the change. And that's great but they give you a lower answer on this question, that's giving you the information that might be useful to know that they're actually starting to engage with what's going on here. And as a result of that, realizing what that change is gonna mean for them and as may not feel as ready for it. Well, you may be happy that they're starting to engage here now. And so having that survey, but now combining it with some other things can give you that insight. And so combining it with observable behaviors that managers might see could give you the extra oomph that you need to really understand what's going on. So whereas the survey might be more subjective, how do I feel about something? Observable is probably more qualitative. And I would have you look at it in two ways. Here's the first, you know, what do people actually see? I, we like to use this kind of framework of are people engaging do they understand are they starting to test and learn and then are they adopting the change there are other frameworks out here you don't have to use this one but i find this one to be useful so engage are people aware of what's changing so we may have not really been getting a high level of engagement is what really what we were seeing in q1 and q2 now people are engaging the score has gone down but we might observe that people are interacting more with materials that are being put out there to describe the change. Maybe they're going to the website that you've set up that gives information about what's happening to the change. We get to understand now, are we seeing, do they understand how the change impacts them? Are we starting to see them go to training and understand what's happening with the training? Are they uh, engaging with whatever else is available? Maybe there's Q and A sessions and they're starting to show up to those and be part of them. In test and learn, we might see, are they doing things to try the stuff out? Do the managers report back that their people are starting to play with the new system, try out the new policy, work with the new procedure, whatever it is that's changing and see what it means to them. Are they starting to test and understand, learn what's really going on with this new change? And then finally, are they adopting? Right? Are they doing things along those way? And with the second thing is we might listen to the questions again, along those same four areas. So are they asking questions about timing or even why is this thing happening? Well, that's kind of an engagement question, right? They're at the beginning of the process. Uh, when they start to ask questions about what do I need to do differently in order to be part of this change or how are the people on my team going to be impacted? And they're trying to understand now. They're starting to ask questions about, okay, when's the training available? And is there a sandbox I can play in? Or how do I try this thing out? Now they're in test and learn. And they're trying to, they want to be part of what's happening and really see what's going on. And then lastly, when they get to the business as usual questions, now you know they've adopted the change. And so combining that with the surveys that you might do and survey questions that you might give could be really meaningful for how do they come about understanding what's really going on with that change. And then lastly, are you getting into existing metrics? And these could be all kinds of things. So I'm giving you a few ideas here, but th these can be all over the place, depending on what the change is. So it can be some productivity metrics, um, operational efficiency metrics. If you're talking about people, it might be, um, are you seeing your retention numbers change the way that you wanted them to change? Whatever it is, that this change is about, you want some metrics that are tied to those. And in a perfect world, they would be tied to the business case, the reason that you're doing this in the first place. And even if you don't have a business case, like that hasn't come together for whatever reason, or your organization doesn't typically use those, you can still ask the question, you know, why are we doing this in the first place? Well, how would we know that this change is going to be a success? What is the organization getting out of it? And then you go ahead and put some metrics in around that to be able to wrap into what that needs to be, what you need to make move in order for that to be successful. That's gonna be really powerful for pulling us all together. I'll, I'll tell you uh, that in my own past, this was certainly important to me. And you know, even um, 
10 years ago when I was working for a large company, I, I wasn't doing change management work. I, I was one of those people leading these big programs. I work for Capital One and Big Bank. Uh, we were going through lots of different mergers and doing all kinds of technology implementations on the back end of those bank mergers to bring all of this together. And I led a bunch of those initiatives. And what I was concerned about are these, this, these kind of metrics. So when people are coming to me saying that they're going to help me with this, this is what I want them to help me with. When they're talking about, well, we're going to look at employee engagement and we'll prove those things. Yeah, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about that as being important. I now realize that's even more important, but I didn't, to be honest, back then, understand that as well. I'm focused on this because this is what my boss is focused on. So if you're driving a change initiative and you don't have these in there, skeptic analysts like me are going to be the ones that are going to push you away because you're not able to show how you're going to make the impact into the initiative itself. And so by including that in here, you're going to be able to take away a lot of that concern that the more hard-nosed analysts are going to bring up about these things and are going to give you a difficult time if you don't have included. So by bringing all three of them together, you can really get to insights, right? So you may do things like pulse checks. Um, if you have an ambassador group, some sort of network of people to help you with the change, you may be doing check-ins with them, weekly check-ins with them. You get these self-reported metrics about what is going on with the change and what's the pro progress look like. You can look at, on the observable level, what kind of questions are people asking? I gave you some examples of some of those, but you could also look at things like, are people sh actually showing up in information sessions? Do they go out to the website? Are they engaging with the training? Whatever it is that's been pulled together. And then lastly, existing metrics. Um, for a technology initiative, you know, one of my favorite is to take a look at help desk metrics. What's going on if you've got some sort of an internal help desk? One of the statements um, uh, I have heard, I'm sure many of you have heard, and this comes um, sometimes from technology people, sometimes from operations people, is we're making this change and we're putting in this new system. People don't have a choice about this. I mean, I don't understand why we have to go through this whole change management process with them. We're taking out the old system and putting in the new system and they'll just have to use it. And yeah, that's true, but people can choose how they're going to use it. And one of the things they can choose to do is they can blow up your help desk because you put in the new shiny CRM system and you're expecting all this value from sales as a result of having this better insight into customers and they don't know how to use it and immediately pick up the phone and they're calling your help desk, which gets overwhelmed with the amount of calls that are there. So understanding what happens with that is going to be important. And that's, I give you that because that's been a major seller for people that are in technology and operations that are thinking about it that way. And so it's a way to give them an indication that that's not so true. Like we, we can be in trouble here if we're not paying attention to how do we do the change. And so as we start to think about these actionable insights, we can look at these questions. What changes in the existing metrics and self-reported channels are notable, right? So it's not everything. We don't want to necessarily look at it all. We want to look at, you know, what's notable? What behavior are we noticing as a result of that? So what are people actually doing, saying? What stands out as a theme? And maybe very importantly, most importantly, what risks do we see? And this is great to have a conversation around with the people that are engaged in the change that are helping you to drive that change and be able to really understand, are there some risks that are starting to pop up? Maybe it's things that you knew about or knew were possible before, and this is a way for you to monitor all that. Um, and then finally, what actions are you going to take? So what are you going to do about it? It's going to allow you to reinforce the progress that you want to make. There are certainly other questions that you can ask, but these will get you to a place where you're doing something with this information. And it's actually getting you to a place where you're going to be able to improve what's going on with this change. Uh, but one of the things that you want to pay attention to in all of this is uh, some of the other considerations that might be out there. So on one side, we're taking a look at what are the goals of the initiative? 
in, without those goals, it's going to be hard to put together some sort of metrics plan. So you're going to want to get that, right? If they're not obvious and clear for you in the business case, then getting them out of the executives that have responsibility for making this thing land and landing well are going to be important in order for this to be successful. So you want to get to that. But against those, you've got two things. You're going to have one, your ability to measure those goals, right? So it's one thing to be able to do it. It's another thing to be able to actually get data that allows you to measure what's going on. Um, and so we're going to want to pay attention to blending all of these together because you may not be able to get to just quantitative data that nails it for you. You may have to add in qualitative data. So is it something higher, or lower, bigger, or smaller? Or you may need to add in just straight up subjective information from the people that are being impacted. And I don't have, we don't have the time to go through all of this, but I will just tell you that by aggregating together the subjective information from a survey, as an example, you can turn that into objective information that you're now able to take action on. So it is valuable to, to bring all that together. So that blended approach is going to help you on this measurement thing. But that's also going to be pressed against all the other external forces that are going to have an impact and alter these goals. Um, and what I would say to you is that if we rigidly hang on to the goals and we don't change them when there's a significant external force, as an example, the company is going through now going through a merger, then which clearly is going to change in many cases what's going on with the change initiatives. And you don't alter what those goals are. Really, what you're now measuring is your ability to predict the future. You're not measuring what's going on with the change because you may now have an impact. Your context is completely altered as a result of what is going on in the example I gave a merger. And you need to rethink what is going to be able to happen with the change you're on. Maybe it's only as simple as the timeline slips out. Maybe the scope got bigger because now there's more people, but something has probably changed as a result of this. And so you want to pay attention to that and bring that into how you're thinking about pulling these, these metrics together. And I'm highlighting that because too often I've seen people not do that and kind of ride their plan into the ground is it's clear that you're not going to be able to meet those you're declaring failure when there wasn't anything that you could do about it, right? These external forces are coming in. So we want to bring that in and think about that in a sensible way. All right, which now this brings us to our last piece uh, in this idea of what are we going to go do about this, right? So we pulled all these together. Now we need to understand how are we going to make something useful happen with all of that. All right, and this is um, going to be wrapped around this idea of uh, values-based decision-making. Um, this is the area that I did my PhD work in, so I've got a lot of passion around this. I promise not to do a recitation of my entire dissertation on this, but um, it's a, it is some interesting stuff and I think does have applicability in the business world and how we're going about doing stuff. And so uh, I'm wrapping this around um, the, this initial work that Ralph Keeney did. Um, he wrote a book, Value-Focused Thinking, which encapsulates all of this together. And I think really gets to the heart of what's going on here. He said this, almost all of the literature on decision-making concerns what to do after the crucial activities of identifying the decision problem, creating alternatives and specifying objectives. Well, where does all this stuff comes from? Well, what he says, it comes from what do people value? And in essence, what he's saying is people and groups are often making decisions backwards. So they start off with the answer, the alternative in this language, and then try and bang up against a process of being able to analyze whether or not that alternative is the right alternative to get to. And I'm sure you've all experienced this because it's so common where people are arguing round and round whether or not an alternative is a good one or not a good one. You may be doing this with your spouse or your date, even when you're going to dinner, because the same thing happens even with that. And what you're not making explicit, but it's there underneath, is what do you care about? There's something that you value that you're using as your way to go about determining whether or not this alternative is a worthy or valuable alternative or not. So what Keeney's saying is do it the other way around. Start off and make the values explicit. What do we care about? 
in, in the business world, that probably leads you to objectives, right? If you want to use that kind of language. And then from there, move into what is going on with these different alternatives. And but you're referring back to these objectives as a way to go about understanding how you're going to go about making this determination at all. So let me tell you how this idea and this uh, notion around analytics all kind of link together. All right, so what I'm going to suggest that you do is a pre-mortem exercise. I'm sure all of you have heard of a post-mortem where you're looking backwards now, something bad has happened, and you're doing a review of what the bad thing is, where did it come from, what could we have done to have been able to see that, and then be able to go do something else to um, take care of that thing. The um, pre-mortem is to do that before you go down the path and to imagine what that bad thing is and then imagine what's going to happen with them. So we're gonna wrap it inside that idea. And what I'm gonna suggest you do is to walk down these steps to bring the analytics piece into that idea of a pre-mortem. All right, so first is select the metrics. So three steps with that. First, as I mentioned, determine what you value. And I, I would have literally done this by passing out sticky notes, asking people to write down all the things that they value and then placing them up on a wall and starting to group them together by like categories. And then declaring what you think those category names would be. Now, here are all these different values that seem similar. What would we call that? That then becomes the objective that the group is interested in. And there are some things that lead to those objectives. And so there can be a hierarchy in here. There's more to it. Than that, but you get the basic idea of being able to pull all that together. And then once you understand what those objectives are, brainstorm. What are the metrics that are going to tell you whether or not those objectives are going in the direction you want them to or not? And for sure, you're going to end up with way more metrics than you're going to want. So you want to start to narrow down the possibilities. Some of that may be, can you actually even get the data? Right? Is it even available? Would you have a, a way, an instrument to be able to gather it? Um, people will probably come up with lots of things that are around a certain area. You probably don't need three or four metrics going after the same thing. One, maybe two are going to be plenty. So you go through a process of narrowing all that down. So now you have, you know what your objectives are, and you know how you're going to measure what's going on with those objectives. As a next step, you want to test the impact of what is going on with the metrics that you have for those objectives. And the way, there are two steps to that. And the way that I would suggest you do that is to determine what the reasonable high value for that metric might be. So if it was a survey and you put the survey out, how high could that go? If it was an existing business metric, what's the likely high value that you might get? Maybe it's a call center error rate or Maybe it's a number of uh, people that are leaving the company. Maybe it's a retention rate. What's the highest that that could go to? And what's the reasonable lowest that that could go to? And then what's your expected value in the middle? That might be just be the average. But those three values are enough to give you an idea of what's going on. And then what you want to do then is look at those values and if you were to reach any of them, would you know anything about the change? And this is very important. So this is going to help you to differentiate metrics that are interesting versus valuable. And there are a lot of metrics out there that people are going to find to be interesting and want to include in all of this, but they won't be valuable because when you think about it and you think about that metric, you may go, well, it doesn't really tell me anything at all about the change. So if somebody says, I'm, um, we're doing a customer resource management, CRM implementation, and I'm worried about th what that's going to do to the sales force. Are they going to be happy with this? And I'm really even worried that they're going to leave. And you go, okay, well, here's my high and low value. If all of a sudden we had a spike in people leaving, would we be able to attribute that back to the CRM? Maybe you can, or maybe you can't, but you know, I might suggest that you're not really able to make that connection. And so that may not be a very useful way 
to go about understanding what the impact is to this change that you're doing around the CRM. So I would think my way through all of that. And then now move over to uh, making contingency plans. And those contingency plans ought to be around the extremes on the metric. So if the metric pops to the top level or pops to the bottom level, what would you then do? This is another check. I mean, if your answer is, well, nothing, then, well, you don't really want to care about that metric, right? It might be interesting, but it's not valuable because you're not going to take action should that metric reach one of its extremes. So I would get rid of it. Go after the metrics that if you hit those values or that you start to move to those values, you would actually want to go do something. And once you've got those together, now you could conduct your pre-mortem, but you're going to do that with this quantitative analytical underpinning and not a completely qualitative approach to it. So that's what we're going to be looking at here. And so I'm going to, I'm going to take this back and put this into this broader setup for you. Um, I do have this metrics identifier um, exercise, and I'm happy to share that with you guys as well if you want to send me an email. I don't think I, I did mention, and now it's probably scrolled up in the chat. I did put a link in the chat for the um, primer that I have on Node Excel. So if you want to scroll up into the chat, uh, I put my email address in there uh, and then a link to that primer. If you go out to that, um, if you submit your email in there, it'll email the thing directly to you so you can get it directly. I don't have this one set up, but if you're really interested, um, this is a much deeper exercise. If you're interested in that, I'm happy to share some of this with you as well. Just send me an email. All right, so here's the process. Let's kind of put this back. Now we're in this values-based decision-making process. You're going to ask all the decision makers to describe what they value with regard to this change. What do they care about? Um, what, what are we going to want to pay attention to? You can think of that as this change goes well, what would you think of as being a success? And then go through and craft what are the metrics. So this is this brainstorm the metrics process that will help you to monitor whether or not you're getting to the things that are going to tell you whether or not this is a success. So you're going to do all that first. Then you're going to want to go and test the scenarios that are there. And the way to do that is to look at the distributions of the values. Okay, this is important not to be looking at singular values like the average, but the entire range, the distribution of it. And the distribution means not only what does it range across, but where are the values showing up uh, the most and where are they showing up the least? So we wanna not only know the highest, lowest, and the most likely, but what we think that distribution looks like. So some common shapes of a distribution might be uniform, meaning that you have as many you may have as much likelihood get as many returns for every single value across the distribution. And this happens in a bunch of things. The second uh, likely one is gonna be a normal distribution, that bell curve, which you see the little diagram here in the middle. Um, and that shows up with lots of things. Height of people is a common example of that. There's an average height that humans have, and then there's a distribution and it gets less and less as you get taller and shorter, so fewer and fewer people are at those values. And that's a typical uniform distribution setup. And that shows up a lot as well. But you may see things like an exponential distribution where everything's shoved over to one side. And you don't need to go into the full-on mathematics of this to do that. You, you can get very good results just by understanding generally what's in here and where you're going to find those values. Um, it's great to go to that next step, and that's certainly the kinds of things that I'm teaching the students back at the University of Richmond when I'm doing that work, but you don't need to do that. Um, you can get just a, a generalized qualitative view of where you're gonna be in that distribution, and that can be very valuable uh, to tell you what are you going what action you're gonna take or what are you gonna do as you start to go across that entire range of the distribution. So you wanna uh, pay attention to that as well. And then that brings us to the last piece where we actually get into making the contingency plans. So you, we want to go through and imagine that a failure has occurred and then make our guess as to why. Why would that, why would that have happened? And then we want to create mechanisms to go prevent that. So that means we want to check and make sure our metrics are going to tell us that. This is our final check on this entire process. If that failure mechanism crept up, would the metrics that we've selected tell us that that thing is happening. 
If they don't, then you need to go get metrics at will. So that's a final iteration of that. And once you do, and you have those metrics and you know what the values would be that start to tell you when things are gonna be going badly for you, now you can put your plans together on what you're gonna do about it. And this is incredibly valuable because as I'm sure you guys have experienced in the heat of it all, when something bad is happening and now you've got to go and put plans in place to go take care of it, that is a very difficult time, especially if there's a lot of anxiety around it, to try and figure that out. It is so much better to be able to have that set up ahead of time so that you know what it is that you're going to go do. So this is an example very squarely out of my flying experience. You know, Brooks mentioned at the beginning that I was a Navy pilot. This is exactly what pilots do as part of their training. You imagine all the emergencies that are going to happen and you understand what the gauges on, in the cockpit are going to be positioned at to tell you that this thing is starting to happen. You know, some obvious things like the oil pressure is starting to come down on the engine. All right, that's going to be bad. So I know what the indicators are when the oil pressure gets too low. The temperature on the engine is probably going up. The power output is probably coming down. I start to see all those metrics change and I know that I've got a problem. That's great to know that, but even better is to know what are you going to do and have thought that through ahead of time so that now I know what actions I'm going to go take to be able to handle that. And you're not going to be able to get everything, but by having gone through what are the likely things that could go wrong, depending on what it is that you're doing, you're way better positioned to be able to handle that. And I know flying is going to be an extreme level of anxiety as you try and fix whatever's going on with the airplane, but I've been in the business world and I've watched people be pretty incredibly anxious about some of the stuff that's happening there. And you can just watch the quality of the thinking start to degrade as the anxiety comes up. And so this is a way to handle that when you're not anxious and you can think it through as rationally as possible and put these controls in place now so that you know what's going on. Use the this analytics setup, this three-tiered approach to analytics to be able to pull all of that together. What I'm going to suggest to you guys to go even further than that. Um, and so what we've been talking about is the analytics around the change itself. And so I like to think about these things in these three layers. So the first layer is the complete the project kind of analytics. And this is the stuff that project managers do. And then largely wraps around the triple constraint, scope, schedule, and budget. And they put metrics in place to understand those. And that's great and certainly very, very useful. But people that do change work know that that's not necessarily sufficient. Like you can land the new customer resource management system. The system can go in, can be working exactly as advertised, but people aren't using it the way that they need to use it in order to get the value out of it. And that's what change management does. And so the second layer is the change management layer. Are you able to achieve your business goal? And so these are the metrics that I've been talking about for the last 20 minutes or so. Can we put these metrics in place to help us understand? But I'm gonna suggest that you go even beyond that. Uh, and what I'm gonna suggest that you start to think about is the culture, because I'm sure you have participated, because sadly this happens all too often, where you're part of a project and it does go well. And you do achieve all of the business goals that you wanted to achieve, but people talk about it as being beat up and bruised. There are dead bodies left in the wake of this project. Bad things have happened broadly to the culture, even though the business goals for the project itself have been met just as you expected them to have been met. And so putting in metrics that help you to understand is that happening would also be useful. And I think a far more powerful way to go after some of these change initiatives. And, in the work that I do as a consultant and in the research that I'm doing as an academic, I'm trying to understand this dynamic. So how does change and culture, what in my company I call joy at work, how do they interact with each other? And it seems pretty clear that they have an impact back and forth. And so if a change goes well, and joy at work is increased. And by joy at work, I mean these 10 dimensions, or at least this is what's coming out of the research that I'm doing. It's these 10 dimensions are the one that seem to be the indicators that 
joy is present at work or not. And if those are increasing, as that comes back around, the very next change is now much more likely to be a success. The opposite spiral is also there. If that change goes badly, even if all the business goals are being mean, but the culture is being diminished, joy at work is being lessened, those 10 dimensions are showing that as lessening, the next time around for the very next change, it's gonna be even harder to be able to take that on for the energy to really be there to do that. And the probability of that change being successful is gonna go down. This is what I think people mean when they start talking about change fatigue and change resistance. I've got too much going on, can't handle it all. Because I've been on the other end, on the positive end of that, where we're doing a lot of stuff and people are energized. So we're changing a lot, but the energy level is increasing. And that's because how it's being done is driving an increase of joy at work. And so that is potentially a very powerful way to be able to improve the culture and to do it in what some people would think of as somewhat counterintuitive, to actually do it through change initiatives. And I, I say that with confidence because I've experienced it. I've been on the positive end of that and have been able to watch the culture around me grow because of change efforts that have had that kind of level of success. So I want to leave you with that idea about doing all of this to not only achieve the project and accomplish the change to get the business goals, but to actually drive your culture in your organization, drive it in a positive way and actually see the joy at work increasing as a result of that. All right, so I'm going to stop there. We've got about 10 minutes or so left. I'm going to stop sharing and I uh, would love to see if you guys have any um, questions or um, other areas that you'd like a little more exploration with the bit of time that we've got left. So if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and toss something in the Q&A. We can bring that up and handle those. Or if you guys are over it and you're ready for a martini, I understand that's great as well. Right. While you're you're pondering those, I will uh, just want to mention again that if you want to reach out to me for any of these things, I'm I'm happy to go um, share any of those with you. Um, you can see a bunch of that stuff uh, for free on the website. So you just want to go to thechangedecision.com. You can pull them off yourself. And, but I'm also happy to share them with you, and would be happy to hear any more about what you guys have going on. Uh, I find all this stuff really interesting. So always great to engage with people who um, also find it interesting. So I don't see any other um, questions. Um, and uh, Ed, there is one in the chat. Oh, there is. Thank you. Um, all right. How do you think this can be applied in the light of discussion about how managers will handle a more hybrid work environment? Yeah, that's great. So um, I think my, uh, I'll give you my quick honest answer is, I don't know, I'm really interested to find out. But here's where um, the kinds of places that I want to I want to play into. I, th I think there's going to be something important around uh, engagement as we start to think about the hybrid environment. And I can see it going either way. So I think certainly some people are going to be happy to be able to stay at home. And there's going to be some general level of engagement that they're going to get joy at work in the way that I talk about it because they're able to stay at home. And that's gonna happen naturally. So if I think about a change initiative, is that impacting that in a positive way or a negative way? And so what I mean by that is, is if part of the organization comes back together and people are isolated at home, that may be difficult. And so in a place in which we've had everyone at home, we haven't really been paying attention to any particular isolation because we're all isolated. And so we're all figuring out how to come together. We have some people back in the office and some people that are out, outside of that, we're going to have to start putting into play mechanisms that are going to help us understand what's going on with the culture as a result of that. And so when I start to think about metrics that are happening, if we're going through a change, I would want to pay attention to engagement that's going on with people 
both whether they're at home or whether they're in the workplace. And so I think knowing that is going to be valuable. So in the examples that I gave, one of the other pieces I would put in is, is that a person that's typically in the office? Is that a person that's typically at home? Is there some sort of a hybrid in there? So getting that kind of information and knowing it, I think is going to be valuable. You know, different organizations are going to be able to tackle that in a different way. Some HR will have that information centralized and others it's gonna be decentralized. We'll have to pay attention to that there. But I think that's gonna matter. And I say that having experienced that in my corporate world, like we talk, many people are talking about this kind of move as if it's unique. And I think if you come from a really big company that's all over the country or even all over the world, you have already experienced some of this already. So I'm been sitting in the office when I worked at Capital One as an example in Richmond, which is where I am now. And the headquarters of Capital One is up in um, Tyson's Corner. And I've been the one lone person sitting in the conference room in Richmond. And there are 10 people in the conference room and up in Tyson's Corner. And so I'm as isolated in that situation as I would have been if I was at my home. And so paying attention to techniques to take that on, I think is going to be really important. You guys have probably seen that kind of stuff of making sure you're reaching out to those people on a more frequent basis. But I think we're going to have to get smarter about what virtual means in a more broad context, because there's going to be more companies that are taking that on. So Luis, I hope that gives you a little bit about what's going on, but I, I think it has to come in and we're going to have to measure it. We're going to understand what's happening with our change initiatives. You are welcome. So Brooks, I don't know if you want to wind us up from here. It looks like uh, we've touched on all the things we want to touch on. Ed, we're extraordinarily grateful to you. Thank you for your energy and your insights. Uh, I've um, observed how my students have been able to take uh, Note Excel and the other tools that you've shared and use them. So to those who are uh, you know, participants, this is something you can do. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, just jump in the, the deep end and, and swim with it. Uh, Ed, we're grateful for your partnership with us at Georgetown. Really appreciate uh, your preparation and then compelling presentation today. And uh, wish everyone a happy uh, evening and a great rest of the week. Thanks so much, Brooks. Thanks everyone for being here. It was great to be able to do this with all of you.